Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for attending uh, this event. Buonasera a tutti. Thanks for being here. And um, I want to extend before starting uh, the greetings of the Consul General of Italy in Philadelphia, uh, Cristiana Mele, who could not be here uh, tonight. This event, this presentation, is sponsored by the Italian uh, Consulate General of Philadelphia and is part of a series of events which you can find uh, on video recordings uh, on my link page, LinkedIn page or uh, the YouTube channel of Italian Innovators. Uh, these events are also part of a series of lectures that I'm giving this semester. Uh, the previous event was related to the Italian pen commercial penetration in the United States. And um, in June, uh, we'll talk about the impact of the Italian Renaissance on uh, 20th century design. Uh, so make sure to follow the uh, to follow me on LinkedIn or subscribe to the YouTube page to um, find these videos. Uh, now, this presentation belongs to a larger work, uh, which is my work on uh, YouTube on Italian innovators, uh, which aims at connecting the humanities and the humanistic disciplines to entrepreneurship. And aims at connecting, as we'll do tonight, personal stories to the development of unique ideas. Now, to talk about Italian fashion, there are obvious points of departure. A historical one, which dates back to the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, or in our modern age, dates back to 1951 in Florence, where scholars conventionally indicate the beginning of Italian fashion. On my YouTube channel, there is a history of Italian fashion of this kind, which I invite you to watch. We could also start from cinema and its multiple connections to uh, Italian fashion, imagination, uh, and we can start from brands like Versace, Gucci, Dolce Gabbana, and Armani that often leave an imprint on the American star system. We'll talk a little bit about them, but tonight I would like to explore Italian fashion starting from its faces, from the personal stories of four innovative entrepreneurs and creators who designed not just remarkable styles, but also surprising models of entrepreneurial success. They are Laura Biagiotti, Brunello Cucinelli, Ermenegildo Zegna, and Elsa Schiaparelli. I'm sure you came here waiting to hear more about Versace, Gucci, Armani, and Dolce Gabbana, but sometimes the best way to understand a painting is not the obvious figure in the center but rather the details, its margins, its visible yet latent elements in the background. So you also probably know more than me about design, dresses, trends that these brands continuously produce. But in order not to talk about the school of Athens without addressing Aristotle and Plato, here are four flashes that I find relevant to stress of these powerful brands that might help pierce through the facade of glamour and move us into its inner core. Now, with regard to Versace, I want to show you the logo and Medusa, a classical theme which Gianni Versace found in an ancient Greek villa of an archaeological site near Reggio Calabria, where he grew up. It was there to magnetize his gaze as in the myth, and it was in its reinvention, or rather in the deposit of classical heritage that Versace made his own, that he found the living spring of his own creativity. So fashion and antiquity, the relationship between an ephemeral present, so modo odierno, the fashion of today from which the word moderno, modern, and a reinvented past, not, not taken as an immobile tradition, but rather conceived as a creative platform. Fashion pursues sources to escape medusification, and fashion 
pursues eternity to escape ephemerality. In this original and eternal spring of the past, fashion finds its attractiveness, so Medusa. With regard to Dolce Gabbana, the reference to the past upbringing or to a territory is also stressed with a particular emphasis. In their case, in relation to Sicily, its folklore, traditions, ways of being, environment, air, and so on. This relationship with a concrete space and not with creativity as a vacuum explicitly becomes culture. So fashion needs culture or art to become grounded, that is authentic, and to become eternal. So the investment in turning fashion into a classic explains why Dolce Gabbana hired in the mid-1990s the Academy Award director Giuseppe Tornatore and the Academy Award score composer Ennio Morricone to author their ad. And I want to play it for you. It's a spectacular two-minute piece of literature, cinema, and music. Here it is. by Dolce & Gabbana, the new fragrance for women. So this is really a spectacular ad that gets involved really two top artists of the Italian 20th century. Now, with regard to Gucci, I want to point your attention to Alessandro Michele, the designer who replaced Don Ford in 2015 and reconfigured the style of the brand in a mix of faithfulness to its core identity and radical change for example, in the feminization of menswear. Now, more than his style, I want you to know the counterpart of Michele's success, which is represented by Marco Bizzarri, CEO of the company. So one of the core elements of the success of Italian fashion companies lies, in fact, in a complex interaction between managers and creative designers, in the productive synergy of creativity, manufacture, and entrepreneurship. Despite what we might think, Italian fashion is an operative system which finds its propelling core in the crucial synergy of roles and in a complex international umbrella of brands. So in our case, Gucci is part of the French holding caring owned by the French business, businessman Francois, Francois, uh, Henri Francois Pinot, which also includes Bottega Veneta and Yves Saint Laurent whose CEO is an extraordinary Italian woman, Francesca Bellettini. So fra fashion is not just creativity, but rather a system. Lastly, Giorgio Armani. What I want to stress in his work is not his rivalry with Versace, their opposite approaches to style, so eccentricity versus classic elegance, but rather his entrepreneurial approach to fashion as a system and a value creator. So Armani is one of the first fashion entrepreneurs who invested in sports as a mirror of, of values. So discipline, teamwork, loyalty, by acquiring the basketball team of Milan and by designing the jerseys of the Italian national team. 
Also, as he recently converted his line to the production of medical clothing for doctors involved in the coronavirus crisis, or as he challenged fashion to move away from the seasonal model, which implies rapid turnovers and high impact on the environment, he related fashion to social commitment and ethics. So fashion, not as a frugality or ephemerality, but as an agent of change. Okay, so we had our power brands introduce us to the core of our talk, the faces of Italian fashion. In presenting you four exemplary stories, I wanna extend our premises and highlight forms and adventures that really deserve our attention and are not necessarily found in movies or in popular culture. So with Laura Biagiotti, I wanna introduce you to the internalization, internationalization of Italian fashion. She was really uh, working in cultural diplomacy. With Brunello Cuccinelli, I wanna stress his conne the connection of fashion to philosophy. With Ermenegildo Zegna, the connection of fashion to environmental sustainability, and with Elsa Schiaparelli, the dimension of fashion as art. Now, Laura Biagiotti is the undisputable ambassador of Made in Italy. On April 25th, 1988, she became the first Western designer ever to run a fashion show in Beijing. On February 5th, 1955, she became the first Italian designer to present her collection in Moscow. And in 1998, she became the first Italian fashion designer to present a collection in Cairo. In China, where the authorities simply call her Mr. Biagiotti, as the government was unwilling to even recognize a, fem a female entrepreneur, she opened up a previously unthinkable path of commercial relations. Some say a new Silk Road. In her fashion show in the Great Theater of the Kremlin, former headquarters of the Russian Communist Party, she presented fashion as a universal language of culture, peace, and reconstruction after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And in Egypt, she presented fashion as a transnational patrimony capable of creating distinctive value, crossing bridges, and harmonizing differences. Now, the story of Laura Biagiotti finds its roots in Rome, where she was born in 1943. Her mother, Delia, was a couturier, and her Roman atelier found recognition in 1964 when she was commissioned to design the uniforms of the national flagship airline Alitalia. Laura's youth unfolded between her studies of classical literature and Christian archaeology at La Sapienza University in Rome and her mother's practical training both in the atelier and in the couture shows she attended in Paris and New York. Both the formation in the humanities and real life experience in a bottega or workshop are two essential components of many Italian success stories. Laura started her own company in 1965, but her label appeared in 1972 in Florence when she held her first independent show at Palazzo Pitti. At the time, Florence was the capital of Italian fashion, but in the subsequent years, a group of Italian stilisti would move the Italian pret a porter system to Milan, launching the city as capital of Italian fashion. In her opening show of 1972, Biagiotti introduced three novelties, which became the trademark of her style. So first, she presented cashmere as her signature material at a time when this woven fabric was still uncommon. Two, she showcased models wearing the same jacket three times with two skirts and one dress, inadvertently launching a new flexible approach to the working woman's wardrobe. And three, she launched white as her signature tone. So white would become the trademark of her understated approach to timeless classiness after a recommendation to her by the fashion guru, Diana Reland, who once asked Laura, why don't you always wear white? So never underestimate the power and gift of feedback in your path toward innovation. Now, Laura's later success also lies in a mix of humanistic heritage and entrepreneurial creativity. Her love for archaeology and the Italian cultural heritage finds expression not just in design, but also in the company's investment in artistic patronage and cultural diplomacy. 
So the company has funded restoration projects in Rome, like the renovation of the fountains in Piazza Farnese or Michelangelo's Cordonata staircase in the Campidoglio. The Piaggiotti Cigna Foundation also gathered a collection of 200 paintings by the Roman futurist master Giacomo Balla, the greatest collection of the painter. Casa Biagiotti also sponsored the gift of a new grand curtain for the Venice Theater, La Fenice, after a fire burnt it down. And as for Armani, Biagiotti expanded its cultural reach by investing in sports in connection to the Olympics as Italian athletes competing in Sydney were the protagonists of a fashion show in 2000 and in connection to golf especially as the brand transformed the um, Marco Simone Golf and Country Club built around the family estate into the official course hosting the 2022 Ryder Cup, the first that will be played in Italy. So rootedness and continuity. Now, Brunello Cucinelli is the leader of Italy's number one cashmere company and a philosopher entrepreneur who crafted a unique ethical approach to the fashion industry. With Cucinelli, we are dealing with an out-of-the-box thinker, an unusual industrial artisan who centered his idea of capitalism around the just balance of gift and profit, receiving and giving. Three are the foundations of Cucinelli's long-term humanistic approach to business. Family, the dignity of work, and culture as an endless source of beauty and creativity. Now, Cucinelli defines family as a guardian of ideals and its intrinsic experience of solidarity and subsidiarity as the greatest defense against what he calls the worst poverty known to man, loneliness. Secondly, Cucinelli sees in dignified work the key to its excellence. In his idea, to work well requires a just balance between professional and private life. So his worker can, workers cannot work more than eight hours per day and have a 90 minute lunch break. And to work well requires human interactions. So limited use of emails and phone communication to create more direct connections among people. Lastly, Cuccinelli points to culture as the key incentive to workers. Drawing from Rousseau's idea that a human being is creative only when he is in harmony with creation, Cuccinelli's model focuses on creativity as a key element giving meaning and dignity to work. This is why his workers receive a substantial cultural bonus to be used for cultural activities like theater, reading, concerts, and to allow, wants to allow his employers to get to know immortal works of art and literature. It's pretty good. Recently, Cuccinelli opened a 100,000 book library in the headquarters of the company. So this is not a utopian model, but rather one of the most successful companies in the world. Now, two moments shaped its vision. One, when Cuccinelli was about 15, when he saw his father coming home from the factory in tears after being mocked and humiliated by his boss. Until that time, when his father started to work in a, family, in a factory, the Cuccinellis were a, families, a family of peasants. And Brunello lived in a house without plumbing, electricity, or a heating system. It was in his work in the countryside that he developed a sense of the just balance that nature provides to men, an appreciation for the natural environment, something that would be replicated in his plant where large windows give workers the impression of working outside. The second moment was when his family moved to the city of Perugia, where his university formation did not come from academia, but rather from the long discussions at Gigino's bar, the local uh, bar in, in the city. And as Cuccinelli pointed out, I studied at Gigino's bar, the bar of my village, for about 10 years. It's not Harvard, but do you know how much being in close touch with people can teach you about how to be in the world? This is like his own words. So rootedness in a story, ability to debate and hear other people's ideas and books. Cuccinelli chose 
thinkers, philosophers, emperors like Heraclitus, Aristotle, Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, but also Saint Benedict and Saint Francis, both Umbrian saints, and Kant, Voltaire, and Rousseau as leading guides for his business. Like the Benedictine monks, and he actually asked one to sit in the board of the company for this reason, he sees business as busyness, which has to do with material work, but also our soul, our intellectual needs. His idea is that in order to generate something fruitful, we need to combine, and these are his words, mind and soul. We must join together Voltaire and Rousseau, Apollos, Apollo and Dionysus, end quote. This is his point of departure and the core of his entrepreneurial philosophy, the idea of a balanced life, which he saw both in his countryside life and in classical philosophy. A sense of temperance as the right harmony, not the compromise, um, uh, at, really at, as the harmony as, of men's overall dimensions and various dimensions. So political, ethical, and spiritual. Now, as the CEO of Bottega Veneta used to say in visiting my university a few years ago, what we seek in our work is perfection, then profit. Or rather, the profit of our work is the enjoyment of a fruitful labor, which has as its parallel component or its measure also a monetary benefit. Now, Zegna, Ermenegildo Zegna, a company that recently became the first Italian fashion brand to be listed at Wall Street, is born of the intuition of his founder, Emmanuel Zegna, who established his wool factory in Northern Piedmont in 1910 with the idea of sourcing the best wool directly from sheep in Mongolia, Australia, and South Africa, and then cleaning, weaving, and designing it into top quality fabric and who started in the early 1930s one of the most daring projects of environmental sustainability with the reforestation of the area surrounding his, his factory. Now the 500,000 plants that were planted have become an oasis or natural park, so oasisenia. The oasis aspired to manifest the company's virtuous growth reflecting the ties between the beauty of the environment and the beauty of production. The forest staged a nurturing environment, stimulating excellence and creativity in the present and implicitly creating at the same time a genealogical chain, ideally prolonging the founder's drive to his descendants, his roots to the later growth of the business. Against this backdrop, Zegna developed a new idea of production, not as a set of separate processes, import of top, top fibers, removal of imperfections, and fabric design, but rather as part of a continuum, of a whole, of a chain. This holistic approach to manufacturing has two effects. First, the production processes are supervised in their flow from raw material to final product, and second, these active steps become part of a larger aesthetic, natural, and cultural landscape. This ethical sense of unity and continuity in manufacturing, manufacturing generates not just a more comprehensive model where textile work, lifestyle, and natural resources are not severed, but also a successful approach to fashion design. As reflected in the brand's two models, from ship to shop and from fabric to style, the in-house supervision of the production chain guarantees the ability to develop both an organic product that connects to its origin and a vibrant fabric, which becomes a living expression of a peculiar environment. So the design of quality is intrinsically related to the design of relevance and meaning. The relationship with the environment is a way to guarantee the most crucial asset of the company, which is its longevity, the passing of shared values, long-term goals. Now, the commitment of Zegna uh, to environment and social responsibility is still a defining feature of the company, which is a global leader in the production of wool. 
Now, the Zenia Foundation continue to invest in natural conservation, preserving the oasis, but also committing funds to the restoration and rehabilitation of Punta Mesco, a UNESCO heritage site, site inside the historic Cinque Terre National Park, which was heavily impacted by erosion. Now, the Zenia Foundation has also invested in local medical structures, programs for local youth and education by creating a scholarship fund which has already enabled 200 Italian university graduates to pursue postgraduate research abroad at leading academic institutions like Oxford, Harvard, MIT, Yale, Columbia, and Stanford. So fashion has to do with the environment as a human, historical, and natural capital. The last figure for tonight is Elsa Schiaparelli, who is the pioneer, really, of Italian fashion. She was the rival of Coco Chanel, but above all, a fashion artist. Her brand today is still associated to the creation of immortal pieces, as we saw in Lady Gaga's dress at the inauguration of President Biden, or in Chiara Ferragni's dress at the Berlin GQ, GQ Award uh, of Woman of the Year in 2021. The story of Elsa Schiaparelli is simply extraordinary. She was born in 1890 from an aristocratic family of Rome. She spent her youth in Palazzo Corsini, which now hosts the National Gallery of Antique Arts. Her father, Celestino, was a scholar of medieval Arabic literature at the University of Rome, which she herself attended and where she studied philosophy. Yes, philosophy. Once again, the Italian model, culture as the base of creativity and business. After publishing a book of poems, which was deemed inappropriate by her parents, young Elsa was sent to a convent in Switzerland as a way to tame her unbridled imagination. To flee an arranged, an arranged marriage, Schiaparelli escaped to London in 1914. There, she got in touch with spiritualism and oriental philosophies, and she encountered William de Wendt de Kerler a paranormal expert, supposed doctor, fake scientist, really a charlatan, whom she married right away after a vaudeville show. She learned only showmanship from him. Apart from that, the marriage with, with Kerler was a disaster. Kerler was convicted for his dubious professional practices, and the couple started moving around, first in France and then in 1916, they left for New York City. Now, in America, her husband fell under the FBI radar for his fraudulent work and his sympathies for the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. So the couple moved to Boston. But after the birth of their daughter in 1920, uh, Kerlo suddenly left, leaving Elsa alone. Now, thanks to the support of her friend Gabby, wife of the Dada artist Francis Picavia, whom she had met on board the transatlantic liner on her way to America, Schiaparelli decided to return to New York, where she started attending a circle of artists. She started a new life and had a love affair with an Italian opera singer, Mario Laurenti. But as the singer died suddenly of a sudden disease in 1922, she decided to move back to Paris and start over. Now back to France, Schiaparelli fashioned herself as an aristocratic and bought herself an apartment in a trendy quarter of the city. Thanks to her friend, Gabby Picavia, she reconnected with the city's surrealist artists and was introduced to Paul Poiré, one of the fathers of modern fashion, who would become her mentor. In 1925, she attended the Paris Exposition of Decorative and Industrial Arts, an event where the surrealist artists presented their first exhibit which also featured works by De Chiri, Coquelet, Miro, and Picasso. Schiaparelli, who was friends with Marcel Duchamp and the poet Jean Cocteau, visited the exhibit and was won over by them. Schiaparelli, Schiaparelli would start to develop a revolutionary style in designing clothing by building on the inspiration of Dada and Surrealism. Now, she opened her Maison in 1927, and her first iconic piece was her hand-knit pullover, featuring an adaptable trompe l'oeil motif of a bow, 
which Vogue deemed a masterpiece and all the most famous actresses of the age wore. In the early 1930s, her designs became so popular worldwide that in 1934, Time magazine dedicated a cover to her and presented her as one of the arbiters of ultra-modern haute couture. She is the first woman fashion designer to be honored on the cover of Time. Now, after this recognition, uh, she started an active collaboration with the painter Dali and the poet Cocteau, a partnership that will generate some of her most renowned pieces. In collaboration with Dali in 1935, she designed a perfume shaped like a telephone dial. And in 1937, her famous shoe hat, a hat shaped like a shoe as well as her magnificent lobster dress for Duchess Wally Simpson, a gown featuring a drawing of a lobster by the Spanish painter. In the same year, she would launch her signature color, the shocking pink. A hot pink she would describe in her words as life-giving, like all the light and the birds and the fish in the world put together. A color of China and Peru but not of the West. The shocking pink, which would also appear in the 1937 coat design with Cocteau, featuring two trompe l'oeil faces and roses, is still a trademark of her style. With World War II, Schiaparelli was forced to leave Paris in 1941 and spent the war years in New York. After the war, she returned to France and continued her activity. Despite being recognized by Newsweek as Schiaparelli the Shocker in a cover of 1949, her business started to wind down, not only because of her rivalry with Coco Chanel, but above all, because of the emergence of Christian Dior's new look. Her shop eventually closed in 1954, and Schiaparelli spent her comfortable retirement in Paris by writing her own autobiography entitled A Shocking Life. She would die in 1973, and her shop in Paris would reopen in 2012, in the same address in Place Vendôme, and is now a leading brand in haute couture. At the conclusion of our chat, I want to add a last note on Schiaparelli's rivalry with Coco Chanel, which is useful to underpin the core of her work. Very simply put, Chanel considered fashion as a profession, whereas Schiaparelli saw it as art. That's the dividing line. On the one hand, the craft of tailoring was a way to serve the demands of an elite and construct its distinction. If you want, this goes back to the logic of the Renaissance courts. On the other hand, haute couture represents instead a symbolic language that goes beyond the ephemeral and contingent value of a specific use or trend and aspires to transcend time and become art that is everlasting something to be placed in a museum with the great ma greatest masterpieces of all time. In its creation of beauty, then, fashion, or moda, is a hybrid art, certainly focused on the ways of today, the modo odierno, but also striving to become immortal. So, Thanks for your attention, and I hope this narrative and entrepreneurial overview gave you a better appreciation of the depth and nuances of what we call Italian fashion, whose appeal is not only in its glamour, but most importantly in its cultural value, in its aesthetic echo chamber, in its holistic and complex depth that we saw exemplified in the persons of Laura Biagiotti, cultural diplomacy, Brunello Cucinelli, ethics and philosophy, Ermenegildo Zegna, environmental sustainability, and Elsa Schiaparelli in their relationship with art. Thank you very much. And if you have any particular comment or question on this presentation, feel free to share it in the comment section.
And thanks for being here and attending this presentation. You can also find uh, some of these profiles uh, on my YouTube channel of Italian Innovators. Well, thanks again, and thanks for your comments, and thanks for your appreciation. I hope this was like an initial presentation on the figures that are behind certain logos. Um, we normally think of logos as um, only commercial brands, but they contain a human story. And as I always point out, an impresa is not just a company, but also the narration, the story that is behind it and then informs uh, its production. So a production without meaning would fall short. And this is really typ a typical model of uh, the Italian approach to fashion, which is not necessarily related to an ephemeral uh, product, but really as a culture creator, a value creator. What part did politics play in the success of these individuals? Thanks for the question. Um, I would say um, in the context of Umbria, certainly uh, Cucinelli has um, particular uh, place in the sense that he um, constructed the headquarters of his uh, company in Solomeo, uh, which has been rebuilt as a Renaissance city uh, in the midst of Umbria. So uh, there is certainly uh, a political element, a political component there, because the city is a city built around the company and built around the um, workers of the company. It's certainly a place to visit if you are in Umbria or near Perugia. Um, also, uh, Zegna was involved with the wool industry. Uh, and as I point out in the episode that I dedicated to Zegna, uh, the wool industry of the Biella Valley uh, in northern Piedmont was particularly powerful, uh, especially in connection to the Sella family. Uh, Sella was um, not just uh, the Minister of Finance of uh, the early uh, Italian uh, state in the 1860s, but Sella, uh, his uh, nephew, was also one of the greatest photographers of the 19th century. So uh, certainly there was an economic establishment. There was a certain particular political context that made um, flourish the, 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 the company. Uh, in the case of Elsa Schiaparelli, well, she's more of an independent uh, artists and certainly uh, Laura Biagiotti uh, developed a presence in Rome. Her headquarters is in a castle or a store castle in the outskirts of Rome. And once again, I like to think of these fashion companies uh, and their um, choices to create their headquarters in a particular eternal environment like the Oasi or in a castle or in a Renaissance city like Biagiotti and Cuccinelli as really the condition to create fashion, not as an ephemeral thing, but as something that lasts. Uh, the relationship between fashion and archives. Well, definitely uh, this is part of constructing a story. Uh, I'm pretty sure all these companies have an archive, uh, especially in dealing with Elsa Schiaparelli, who was a real artist. Um, the practice of, uh, the archival practice, the practice of collecting the pieces um, as they come out is one of the biggest ways to create a story and not uh, be embedded in the present, not being um, kind of 
confined to just the present, which is one of the dynamics of fashion. Trend is a form of presentism. Uh, so the practice of archiving, of the archival practice, is certainly from the philosophical point of view, but also from an entrepreneurial point of view, a way to build a story. Grazie. And as the fashion pioneer Rosa Genoni, she was like a early, late 19th century, early 20th century fashion designer, really pioneer of uh, female fashion, uh, um, feminist activist uh, who won a prize in 1906 for her Primavera gown modeled on a reinvention of Botticelli's uh, Primavera painting. Uh, she used to say, la moda è una cosa seria. So fashion is a serious thing. So I hope this presentation was a way to connect this practice, uh, which we might relate really just to uh, a commercial uh, habit or just the ephemeral habit of buying, to connect this to a serious philosophical reflection. As Elsa Schiaparelli used to say, uh, un abito è un pensiero. So a piece of clothing is a thought, uh, is a way of thinking. So once you observe the dresses of these uh, companies, of these stilisti, uh, you have to keep in mind uh, the core of their stile, uh, that is, the idea that a dress is a culture maker, is a coded language that aspires to um, be as rich and as full with contents as a book. So I hope this will allow you to observe uh, dresses in uh, as books, as uh, content creators. And thanks again for all your uh, comments and uh, the words of appreciation and your questions. If there is no other question. We can close here. So once again, thanks everybody for attending this presentation. Uh, also, thanks everybody who will watch it maybe later on uh, my LinkedIn profile or on uh, the YouTube channel of Italian Innovators. I also wanted to extend once more uh, my heartfelt gratitude to the uh, Consulate General of Italy in Philadelphia for sponsoring these events and uh, reminding you of the upcoming event that will take place in June. Um, always on LinkedIn Live and on YouTube and uh, Italian Innovators, which will deal with the impact of the Renaissance on contemporary uh, 20th century and 21st century Italian design. Grazie. Arrivederci.